So good morning, 11.57 in the morning. Great to be with everybody here today. My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, many of you guys know me. Uh, we have a, my wife and I, we have a couple of little girls that are there in the back in Children's Church right now. Uh, got a five-year-old, soon to be six. We got an eight-year-old, soon to be 13. Uh, and then my wife is, a, is Andrea. She's, she's from Colombia. So we're like a, a little bit of like an intercultural um, relationship, right? She's from Colombia. She grew up there. She was there until she was like 20-something years old and then came up here to the United States. Um, so when I met her, like I spoke a little bit of Spanish, like from high school Spanish. And you know what high school Spanish is all about, biblioteca and whatever. So I was like, I'm, like, I'm going to impress this girl, right? So I was, I was trying to come talk to her in Spanish. And I actually had this, this, this like high school level Spanish book that I like looked at every once in a while to remember, you know, Spanish words. So I actually took it to her right after I first kind of met her and we got to know each other a little bit. And I brought her this Spanish book and I was like, here you go, just in case you need it. And she was like, you're adorable, aren't you? But I, I speak Spanish. Like, you understand, this is a Spanish book. I don't really need this book. And uh, it was kind of funny. We, uh, we went down to Colombia. We spent some time down there. And uh, man, being like the gringo in Colombia and like learning a whole new culture and, and immersing and, and trying to like learn the language and stuff. There's all kinds of, all kinds of things that you're going to learn, right, when you're, when you're trying to learn a language. And, and sometimes there's like misunderstandings that can happen. Sometimes there's words that sound like a different word, but it's, but it's uh, you know, you get confused there. And sometimes there's sayings and phrases. I really empathize with people who are coming to, to the United States and they're trying to learn English. There's so many phrases that we have in English that are just really hard for them to, to understand the translation to. And I remember uh, being down in Colombia, and, you know, we're visiting churches. My, my wife, Andrea, is a pastor's kid. We're visiting churches and kind of having, like, you know, hangout time and stuff. And I remember being with a crowd of people, and we're all you know, deciding on what to do. And I was like, hey, I'm going to tell them, let's, let's, go, let's go out to lunch. So I was like, let's go eat lunch, everybody. And, uh, and they all turned around and looked at me, and I said, let's go eat each other. And they were like, <laughs> I remember another time uh, we, were, we were traveling around the city, and um, someone was like, I, you have to try this like special cheese that they have here in Bogota, Colombia. And I was like, okay, okay. Well, they went and they got it and they brought it back to me and they said, oh, this is queso, which is cheese, queso de pera, which is pear. And it looked like a pear. It was pear-shaped cheese, right? However, in the moment, my Spanish wasn't that great. And I thought they said queso, which is cheese, and pera instead of pera. You know, like you, you like roll the R's, pera. And if you know Spanish, you know that means like dog cheese, so I thought that they were trying to offer me dog cheese instead of, instead of like pear-shaped cheese. And, and for the life of me, I was like, Randy, you're a foreigner here. You're trying to like make a good impression. It's like her family and stuff. You have to eat the dog cheese, Randy. Eat the dog cheese. And inside my mind, I'm like, I'm like I can't stop thinking. I'm like, but I can't stop thinking about these like, is it like an underground like dog milking operation happening in, in Bogota? It's like they're finding stray dogs and bringing them to some factory and milking dogs and making cheese. I was like, I don't want that cheese. Like, seriously, I don't want the dog cheese. And they're like, they're like, what? I'm like, I don't want the dog cheese. They're like, okay. And they explained to me it was, it was cheese of the pear, pear-shaped cheese. And I was like, oh, man. I probably, to this day, that was like 10 years ago or something, I probably still have not lived that down to this day. But um, one of the phrases that they like to say down there in Colombia, uh, which is a little interesting, is, is if you think that you're hot stuff, they'll say like, oh, you think you're the last Coca-Cola in the desert, don't you? And it's interesting, right? It's interesting because, like, first of all, Coca-Cola is not what I'm thinking about if I'm, like, super warm and I'm in the desert or something. I'm like, I'm not looking for Coca-Cola. I'm looking for, for water, right? You're looking for, for water. But interestingly and culturally down there, especially with, like, the older generation, like, like my in-laws and stuff, like, water for them, like, if you were to offer them water and you're trying to be, I've tried to my mother-in-law. I've, like, offered her water before, and she's been like, she's been like, why are you offering me? Like, they don't like water. They don't like water. They would much rather drink literally anything else but water. It's just interesting how cultures work and how languages work and stuff. So we've been married uh, uh, quite a while at this point in time. I'm going to dodge like trying to add all the numbers from, you know, 2007 till now and trying to remember what anniversary we're on. But we've been married for quite a while. We've been through uh, a, lot of, a lot of just good times and a lot of funny things. And that's just, uh, that's just one of the things that I've learned. You know, you, you're around different people and you learn different things. So uh, yeah, you're the last Coca-Cola in the desert. You think you're the last Coca-Cola in the desert, don't you? So today, uh, what I want to talk about is a story about kind of like a desert and a, a hot place, a very warm place, and a, a drink, a water, a well that they had there in this area, this warm area that Jesus came to. It's a very well-known story. Um, I actually did a little Devo on it 
maybe about a month ago at our Friday prayer. It was like 10 minutes long. And I was, after it was over, after I did this little Devo kind of a teaching, I was thinking, man, I would love to spend a little bit more time and, and go a little bit deeper in that story. I'm going to move this, sorry. Hi. Uh, I'd like to, to spend a little bit more time in that story. Like 10 minutes, I felt like just wasn't enough. And if you have heard me speak before, or maybe heard me talk a little bit before, one of the things that, that I really strongly believe in is, is that the Word of God, like the Scriptures, man, you can, you can read it on the surface, like just kind of passing through, and you'll get stuff. You'll be like, oh, that's cool. But when you start to scratch that surface, right, when you start to dig a little bit, and you start to go a little bit deeper and stuff, you start to realize that it just goes forever. Like the Word of God is so profound and so deep. There's no end to it. There's no end to it. So I want to pick it up here at this, at this well uh, at a place called Samaria in John chapter 4. So John chapter 4, we're going to pick it up in verse number 4. And Jesus is there, and they're going through Samaria. Him and his disciples are going through Samaria. So off the bat, just in that first line, Samaria, you would know that back in the day, right, the Samaria, Samar Samaritans and the Jews who, who Jesus and his people were, they didn't really get along. In fact, they actually didn't like each other. It was two different cultures, two different backgrounds, two different, they just did not get along. So the fact that Jesus is going through Samaria, automatically, right away, we're thinking, man, he's kind of in enemy, enemy territory here, Samaria. So they're there, they're going to, to, through Samaria, they go to a town in Samaria named Sychar, near the plot of ground, Jacob, Old Testament, big name in the Old Testament, Jacob, had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, in verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well. It was about noon. So there's a couple things here. This is like the setting, right? We're going to talk about the setting. He's in Samaria. They're in kind of enemy territory. Jews would go out of their way to avoid contact with Samaria almost at all costs. But for some reason, they're there, kind of in hostile territory, and they're at this well that's there. The well is called Jacob's Well, and it's noon. And I want to I focus on that for a second, because noon is not the time of day in that region where you want to be outside going to a well to get water. In fact, people would go when it was much cooler out, because they don't want to go out there in the hot, hot sun and be lugging that water to and fro, because you're, you're putting a bucket down in the well, and you're pulling it up, and you're filling up your big jar of water that you brought there, and you're carrying this jar of water all the way back to wherever you came from. You don't want to do that in the hottest time of the day. But Jesus finds himself there at noon, high noon, hottest part of the day, and he's weary and he's tired and he's sitting down in enemy territory, and this is the setting, and this is where we pick it up. Verse number seven, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. So here comes trouble. Here comes trouble, a Samaritan woman. Jesus, the guy who's not supposed to have any dealings really with the Samaritans because they're both hostile towards each other, he asks her, he says, will you give me a drink? Now we see in the parentheses, the disciples were not around. They had gone off to town to buy food. So literally, it's Jesus hanging out at a well by himself, the hottest part of the day in enemy territory, and a Samaritan woman comes, and it's just the two of them, and he says, will you give me to drink to this woman? Now, Jacob's well is interesting, and I want to actually show pictures because we, we know where that is. Uh, this is. This is one of the most... Uh, authentic sites. It's actually considered maybe the most authentic site in the Holy Land because you can't really move a well that's 140 feet deep like somewhere else, right? It's a 140 foot deep well in the ground and it's been there forever. So even Jews, Christians, throughout history have all identified actually this well that you see on the screen right there as the very well that Jesus was sitting at that day and the Samaritan woman came over. And if you were so inclined, you could actually go and visit this well today. Let's show, let's show down in the well. You could go and visit this well today. They could put the, put the bucket down into the water, pull up water, and you could drink water from the same well that Jesus was sitting at. In fact, the same well that Jacob, the forefather of all the Israelites, dug. He dug that well. He drank from it himself. That's the same well right there. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. 140 feet deep. And I want to I make a mention here, just, just talking about Jacob real quick. Jacob was, was the man to these people. Jacob was, like, was almost like a rock star. He was known everywhere. The Samaritans and the Jews, they both considered Jacob to be their forefather. 
You see, they, they once were, the Samaritans and the Jews, they once were all together in the tribes of Israel. They all, they all kind of hung out together as one unit, and Jacob was their forefather. And then over the years, splits happened, and they started kind of fighting over things, and, and they believed different things, and the Samaritans kind of fell away, and now they're apart from each other, and the Jews blame them. They're like, you guys are, you guys are half-breeds. You guys have given up the God of our fathers. What are you guys even doing over there? Now they don't even have anything to do with each other. But Jacob... Their forefather is the one thing that they have in common. And speaking of Jacob, and I just want to make a real quick mention of this. Jacob, Jacob actually, this is Jacob's well. Jacob met his wife at a well, much like that well. If you read the Old Testament, it might seem like a minor detail, but Jacob met his wife at a well. And if you are studying the Old Testament a little bit more, you'll know that Jacob's father, Isaac, another heavy hitter from the Old Testament, Isaac also, they met his wife at a well, much like that one. So if you have like the three big hitters, you got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, well, both Isaac and Jacob met their wives at wells, much like that. And okay, maybe that's coincidence, but let's, uh, let's see, who's another big hitter from the Old Testament outside of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Who do we got? Moses, I heard it, Moses. Yes, so where do you think Moses, where do you think Moses found his wife? Tinder, right? <laughs> no, it was at a well. It was at a well. So you have all these big hitters from the Old Testament. You got Isaac, you got Jacob, and you have Moses himself. All of those guys met their wives at wells, just like that well that we just showed you. And we're gonna, we're gonna put that in our back pocket for now. We're gonna come back to that a little bit later, but let's just keep that in mind as we're moving on here. We're gonna come back to that. So the Samaritan shows up, the Samaritan woman. He says, give me to drink. And she says to him in verse nine, he says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. I'm like double cursed here. I'm not just a Samaritan, but I'm a woman too. You want double nothing to do with me. How can you ask me for a drink, she says. And in parentheses, for Jews do not even associate with Samaritans. What are you doing talking to me? I'm double unclean to you. In fact, Jesus risks being unclean by even hanging out with her. Jesus could like receive a water from her or be sitting there with her and he could be considered unclean, spiritually unclean because he's hanging around with some people who are considered so greasy, so dirty, so beneath him that he's gonna get like spiritual cooties from hanging out with this Samaritan woman. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. How can you ask me for a drink? There were major things that separated the two of them, even though they were right next to each other. There was like big walls in between the two of them, the major things that separated them. She could easily say, I'm not one of your, she's basically saying, I'm not one of your people, Jesus. What are you doing talking to me? I'm not one of your kind, Jesus. I'm not your type. There's a huge chasm that separates me from you here. I don't dress like you. I don't talk like you. I don't come from where you come from, Jesus. What in the world do you want talking to me? And I think if we kind of fast forward this encounter to modern terms and say maybe one of us happened to meet Jesus at a well like this, I think that there would be some situations and some things that we would have in our lives that we would put forward as the barriers between us and Jesus Jesus, I'm not a church person. What are you doing talking to me? I don't believe in this stuff. I don't believe in that religion, Jesus. Maybe I've deconstructed Jesus. Maybe, maybe I've been burned by church, Jesus. Maybe I've been cheating on my wife, Jesus. What are you doing talking to me? Maybe I'm a Jew. Maybe I'm a Muslim, an atheist. Maybe I'm gay. I'm trans. I'm agnostic. There's a million different things that separate me from you, Jesus. Why are you talking to me? Why in the world would you ever want to talk to someone like me? You're not supposed to like me. And she's saying to him, how are you going to ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? And he just goes on undeterred. He answers her in verse 10. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water. 
So they're standing at a well. The well you have to put a bucket in to get water out of. He asks her for a drink. And then he says, if you would ask me for a drink, I would give you living water. She's like, huh? Where's your bucket, man? Like, you, you're just sitting here asking me for a drink two seconds ago. We're going we're gonna to materialize a drink from. She's got her eyebrow raised at this. She's like, am I being punked? What are you talking about, man? If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So, sir, verse 11, sir, she says, you got nothing to draw with and the well is deep. What you can do, reach your hand in there? It's 140 feet deep. Where are you going to get this living water? She continues, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and he drank from it himself as did his sons, all of his people and his livestock? Are you better than Jacob, the one who gave us this well? She doesn't yet realize who she's talking to, but she's on the right path. Are you greater than Jacob? Because the truth is, The truth is that Jacob gave a well that provides water, but Jesus is the giver of a greater gift, living water. I don't want you guys to see here, there's there's like an exchange happening. There's an exchange happening. He's asking her for a drink of water. Can you put down your bucket and bring it up and and, and just give me like like a cup full of water or something? Just give me a cup full of water. So she has like maybe a cup full of water to offer him. And he on the other side has like a river, like, a, like an endless, boundless ocean of fresh water springing up from inside of him that no cup, no bucket, no bath, not even the entire world could contain the amount of water that he has for her. It's this little cup of what she can offer. And it's this huge, boundless amount that Jesus can offer in return. She doesn't yet know who she's talking to, but she's talking to the Lord. And she probably knows her scriptures, right? She probably knows some of the scriptures. She's heard of Jeremiah maybe, right? Of course. Jeremiah talks about living water. Jeremiah 17, it says, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. It says, those who turn away from you will be written in the dust. What happens to dust? It just... Because they have forsaken the Lord. And who is the Lord? He is the spring of living water. So when he's telling her, I have living water to give you, he's starting to reveal who he is to her. And she is like, who's this guy? The woman... Excuse me. For this water that he's talking about, you don't need no cup. You don't need no bucket. You don't need a rope to get down into that water 140 feet deep. This water ain't found underground. It's bubbling up to the surface in a great spring of water, free for all to drink, to taste and to see that the Lord is good. It's available to all. You don't have to work for this water. It doesn't matter who you are and where you're from, what you look like, what your past is like. It's available to all. And this woman, as we're going to see, this woman has spent her whole life running after things that could never satisfy running after things that could never satisfy her need and fix and heal her brokenness and provide what she's been looking for her entire life. She's been looking just in the wrong places because nothing on this earth is going to satisfy the true needs of us. I want us to see here that the living water, God, the living water chose to have thirst so the spiritually thirsty could drink and be satisfied. He chose to be thirsty. He didn't have to be thirsty. He's God. He created water. He created the heavens and the earth. He could manifest a little drink and drink it himself. But he chose to identify with us and walk alongside us and experience weariness, as it said in that first verse, and tiredness and thirst. He chose, the living water chose to have thirst so the spiritually thirsty could drink and be satisfied. Verse 13, the story goes on. Jesus answers, he says, everyone who drinks this water from the well, 
Everybody who drinks that water is going to be thirsty again. If I drink this right now, maybe like 20 minutes later, I'll be thirsty again. It helps for a little while, but then it's gone. It doesn't permanently quench thirst. Anybody who drinks this is going to be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. She's got to be like, what is, what is going on here? He continues, indeed, the water I give, I give them will become in them springs of living water. Can we go to that next verse there? Yeah. Springs of living water welling up to eternal life. Springs of living water. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here day after day. Week after week, month after month, year after year. I don't want to keep coming to this well and dragging my big old jar and filling up, doing all the work to fill it up and carrying it back to where I come from. Like, we take this stuff for granted. You know, at your house, you can just, like, flip a, flip a faucet, right? And there's, like, water coming out in your kitchen. You, you, can, go, you can go upstairs and you could, you could run the bath or something, turn on the shower, boom, water is like, it's like magic. She would probably think it's magic. Just come right out of that, that shower head. You can go flush the toilet. It's like water here. Water, it's just on demand. Everywhere's water. And back there in that, in that day, the whole village, nobody had running water. So they all had to go to the same place to find water. They were all coming to that well. And every day they were, oh man, we got we to gotta, we gotta water the animals. The animals need to drink. We got to wash clothes. We got to wash dishes. We got to drink ourselves. We got to bathe again and again and again and again. Back to the well, back to the well, back to the well, back to the well. The whole village, back to the well. And it's funny because she's there when no one else is there. 12 noon, hottest point of the day. Why is she going there at that time? That's a weird time to be going to the well. She says, give me this water that you're talking about, this living water, because I'm tired of coming back here every day. I don't want to have to keep coming here to draw water. And there's a little play here between the two types of water. You have the well that's 140 feet down and you got to work for it. Somebody dug that out of the ground. They dump a bucket in there on a rope and they pull water up and they cart it off in jars. And that well is being contrasted with a spring of living water bubbling up through the surface like a fountain or a geyser or something. In English, the word spring, we kind of lose the meaning. It's like, oh, it's a spring of water. I remember, I remember, I remember growing up in the, in the woods. Like, I grew up like, yeah. I grew up maybe a, maybe a half hour or so from here up north, and, and I got lucky. I was blessed because my backyard was just into the woods, and there was like acres and acres and acres of woods that nobody cared about. And me, as, a, as like a 9, 10, 11-year-old boy, I spent all my time back there in that woods. I was just traveling around. I was just exploring, like checking out all the trees and all the stuff and ruining my shoes in the swamps when I was walking. My mom hated it. I would, I would go and see animals and birds, and there was a stream back there. And so I'd put on, like, real boots, like boots I can go in the stream with, and I would walk through the stream, and I'd find, like, crayfish, and I'd see, like, sometimes I'd see, like, a trout or something. And I remember walking through that stream and, like, seeing something, and I looked down, and what I saw coming up from the bottom of the stream was bubbles. It was bubbles. And I realized that I looked closer, and I was checking it out. That was a spring, a spring that was bubbling up into the water and feeding that groundwater and bringing fresh water to the surface from underground. The English word spring, we lose it a little bit, but the Greek word clears it up for us because the Greek word for spring actually means to leap up or to jump up off the ground. You're springing up. So you have the well where you have to go down and dig and work for versus the spring that is bubbling up living water from the ground. Do you see the contrast? I don't want to have to keep coming here day after day, she tells him. And he's telling her, this living water I have is like a spring bubbling up to eternal life. She's got to be thinking, who is this guy? She says, in verse 16, she says, sir, give me this water. I'm sorry, it's in verse 
15. The woman says to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And his answer to her is weird because she's asking for the living water, but he's going to answer her with something that seems abrupt and weird and kind of rude. She says, Sir, give me this living water. And he says, Go call your husband and, call, and come back. Why would he say that? He knows who she is. He knows where she comes from. He knows what she's been up to. Why would he say that to her in that moment? She's like, sir, give me this living water. Why don't you go get your husband? Come back. He's not being rude. He's starting to reveal himself even more to her as someone who knows about her, who saw her even on her way before she got to the well. He knew her. Setting her up is what he's doing. He's teaching her about who he is. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she says. And if you're one of those original Jewish readers and you're reading the gospel and you know your Old Testament, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I remember. I remember Jacob. He met his wife at the well. I remember Isaac. He met his wife at the well. I remember Moses met his wife at the well. And now she's saying, I'm a single lady, Jesus, at the well. Where is this going? A guy at a well talking to a lady without a husband. What's going to happen? And you kind of call this the turn, right? It's like all of a sudden it, it, it takes a sharp turn where you're not expecting. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband. And Jesus says to her, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man that you're with now, well, he's not even your husband. He has six guys. So what you said is quite true when you're telling me you don't have a husband. Sir, the woman says, sir, you're freaking me out. <laughs> That's what I would say. That's not what she said. And if somebody read my mail like that, I'd be freaked out. But she says, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Why, Why isn't she being offended in that moment when he's saying, you've been married five times and the guy that you're with isn't even your husband? Why is she not being like, hey, who are you? Why are you talking to me like that? Who do you think you are? It's because in that moment, he's drawing her in. He's drawing her in and all that stuff from her past, all that shame, all that talking about her behind her back that all the other villages probably did, villagers probably did. She's so focused on him that she's like forgetting herself. She focuses on his person, not her own. She's transfixed. She's lost in him in that moment so much that she doesn't even take offense at what he just said. And he's not trying to offend her. He's trying to reveal himself to her. I want to be like her. I want to be so lost in Jesus that I lose myself that I just look to Jesus and I just forget about my past and all the things. Lord, it's just you. It's just you. You're my future. We sang that song. You're my future. My past and my shame and all the stuff that I've done, that's not my future. You're my future. I want to focus on you. Be so lost in Jesus that you lose yourself. Your problems, your past, even our dreams, our desires... Our preferences, our opinions, all that is out the window when we're looking at Jesus, when we come face to face with the living God. Is it not worth it to just cast it all aside and forget all about our lives and just look to Jesus? He's calling and drawing you in. I can see you're a prophet, she told him. I can see you're a prophet. I can see there's something special about you. You knew something that you shouldn't have known unless it was a God thing. I can see there's something special happening here. I can see that you're a prophet. But then she starts talking about the differences and the things that separate them again. She says, I can see you're a prophet. And she starts talking about the differences between Samaritans and Jews again. She says, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. What about these things that separate us, Jesus? You're meeting me here at this well. You're meeting me here at this point of time in my life. I'm here in the hot noon sun because I'm avoiding my neighbors. What about the things that separate us? 
Verse 21, he says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem because that was one of the main things that separated Samaritans from Jews. One believed you worship God here. The other believed that you worship God there. Jesus says the day is coming when that's not going to matter because God is something beyond what the physical realm can contain. He continues, he says, you Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. And I remember reading this years ago and being like, what does that mean? That's kind of weird. Salvation's from the Jews. Jesus was Jewish. And if he's that living water and he came to this earth as a Jew by birth, then he was like that living water bubbling up from the Jewish people in a spring, a spring of living water jumping up from the Jewish people and overflowing to the world, to everyone who would taste and see and receive him. Salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, he says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. He's telling her the things that divide us on the surface will not matter, and they don't matter anymore. It doesn't matter that you were born somewhere else to a different family, a different people. You speak a different language. You're not from around here. You look different. It does not matter where you worship. God is spirit. You can't hold him in a building. He can't be held in a place. He's beyond that. It ain't about our differences. We have to get our eyes off the physical and fix them on the spiritual to see what's really going on here. And she's confused. Verse 25, she says, I I, I know the Messiah called the Christ is coming. I I know the Messiah is coming someday. And when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. And I want you to catch this. If you catch nothing else, I want you to catch this. Because this is John chapter 4. Jesus has not revealed himself to anybody yet. He hasn't revealed himself to the disciples. That means he hasn't told Peter who he is. He hasn't told John who he is. He didn't tell Nicodemus who he is. He has told nobody who he is. But in this moment, at this place, in the least likely of places, at noon in enemy territory with a woman, that by all means he should not have been talking to the least likely, he speaks and reveals himself to the despised. I, the one speaking to you, I am he, he tells her. I am the Messiah. (laughs) Can you imagine this conversation? It's still just the two of them. She's probably like just blown away. He knew the stuff about me that no, nobody could have known. I see he's some kind of a prophet, somebody like sent from God or something, and I start talking about the Messiah, and he tells me he's the Messiah. She's blown away. It's the first person he reveals himself to in the book of John, that Samaritan woman, the very first. Not even the disciples. Speaking of the disciples, they pick that very moment to come back. They're coming back from town with food or whatever, and they see Jesus sitting with a Samaritan woman. Verse 27, the disciples return. They're surprised to find him talking with a woman, but nobody dared to ask, what do you want with him? Why are you talking to her, Jesus? Then what does she do? What does she do? She leaves her water jar. She just leaves it. She came there to get water to bring back for her life. She came there to get water to bring back home for drinking and bathing and washing. She brought that jar there to that very well that day with the intent of taking water that would temporarily quench her thirst. But now, now she has left it. She has left it, and it says that she left her water jar, and that woman went back to the town, and she said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I did. Could he be the Messiah? Could he possibly be the one who's going to bring peace where there is war? Could he possibly be the one who's going to bring life where there's death, to dry every tear, the one who we put our hope in? Could it possibly be this guy over here at our well? 
where we get water from every day. Some people think she's the first evangelist. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and they made their way toward him. She left everything behind to go draw men unto him. She left it all. And when she comes to town, she comes to the village and she tells everybody, come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. Trust me, them villagers knew all about that woman because she's already been with half the town, half the village. And I say that truthfully, not, not, not jokingly. When you're in a little village like that, word travels fast. She's been married to five different men and is now living with a sixth man. But at the well, she met number seven. She met the great, what the scripture refers to as the great bridegroom, the groom, the husband of the church. In that moment, she met a man, the seventh man in her life, who is the number of completion, the number seven. Never again was she going to thirst or look for someone else to fill what no one else had ever been able to satisfy because this man, this God, this Messiah had given her Do you see that? <laughs> Do you see how the scripture works, how God made this thing? At the very well that Jacob dug with his own hands, Jesus meets this woman and reveals himself as the husband to what was going to be the church. And now she's running out to these villagers, she's telling everybody about, come see this guy, come see this guy. Come see this guy. She is now like the well. She's now like living water springing up inside of her. And she runs out there and this living water is like bubbling to the surface. And these people are hearing her testimony because she has a testimony now. She's, they're hearing her testimony and they're drinking of that bubbling spring water that's now welled up inside of her. And they're tasting and seeing and they're coming to Jesus. We're going to close it here. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town, they believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did, she was saying. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay for a couple more days. So he did. And because of his words, because of the words of Jesus, because of that living water that was overflowing from Jesus, springing up to eternal life, they heard the word, they tasted that living water that he spoke to them, and they received it. And what does it say? They became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe. Just because of what you said, we've tasted and seen ourselves. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is who? The savior of the world, the Samaritans, these despised people, these like outcasts are the first ones that he reveals himself to. And then they start walking around. They're the first ones saying, that guy right there, that's the Messiah, that's the savior of the world. Not even his own people, not even the Jewish people at that point were, were understanding who he was. He revealed himself to them, the Samaritans first. This is a crazy story. It's so deep, you right? It's so deep, you can just keep digging and it's like so much more and so much more. He met her at the water and now she has living water springing up inside of her to eternal life. And people are now drinking from that water in her and now it's springing up into eternal life in them and that's how the word of God works. That's how God himself works. Do you think, did I write this book? I didn't write this book. Somewhere along the line, I got this, I got this word inside of me and it just, it just did something to me and now it's the spring of living water and I speak life-giving words that come from this, that ultimately come from the Lord. Can you hear it today? Can you hear it today? Uh, the Lord is the best. He wants to make you today. Not just like that Samaritan woman. He wants to make you today like that spring of living water, leaping up, jumping up, bubbling up to overflow, 
so that people around us in our life, God, if this is you, Lord, you do it. God, I'm gonna mess it up, Lord, that you would just bubble up in me and just, just do whatever it is that you do. Bring the right words, bring the right people around, whatever it is, God. I'm shy, I'm anxious, I don't know how to talk to people. God, that you would do that in me. I gotta trust that that same God that created the heavens and the earth has the power to work through me. So today, Jesus told her, whoever drinks of this water will never thirst again. Elsewhere in scripture, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never hunger again. I remember about a, about a week or so ago, um, I don't know how I came across it. I think it was I think it was because of the Super Bowl, right? The Super Bowl was like a month ago or something now. Who played the Super Bowl? Who was the Super Bowl halftime show? Come on, I know it's church, but you know who it is. Come on. Usher, right, okay. So Usher did the Super Bowl halftime show and I watched it, it was all right, right? It was like, whatever. And I, and I happened to be like in YouTube or something and there were some comments about it and it was like, listen, if you wanna see the best halftime show ever, go and watch the one from like 17 years ago. It's this guy, it's Prince, right? I'm like, oh, I'm not, I don't know nothing about Prince, but I'm like, I'm interested to see because everybody's saying this is this, 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 kind of show was like a spectacle and it grabbed everybody's attention and everyone was lost watching Prince. So I, I went back and I just watched it. I put it on, I watched it. And it's interesting because it's like the Super Bowl halftime show and right before this guy's about to come on, it starts pouring rain. It starts pouring rain and he comes out and it's pouring rain and it's like this crazy scene and, and he's walking around and, and, and this is the time before there was like backing tracks, before there, was, before there was like any plan B to fall back on. They're handing this guy Prince live guitars and he's just taking a live guitar in front of all these people and he's like ripping Jimi Hendrix style solos and when he's done, he's like throwing the guitar and he's walking over here singing a little bit and somebody else hands him a, another live guitar and he's ripping that one like Jimi Hendrix and he goes on and on and then at the end of this pouring rain set. He has this song, if you know this song, he has a song called Purple Rain and they put up his, his little symbol thing and it's in purple and it's pouring rain and smoke is coming off the lights and it's purple and he's singing Purple Rain and the rain to millions of people live at the Super Bowl. It is the pinnacle of an online, of a, of a, of a live show. And I was looking in the comments there and they're like, you think this is good, this is great, but, but there's another all time great live performance. You gotta check out this other one by a guy named James Brown. When he was on a talk show, he came out and he killed it so bad that the people were just transfixed by what he was doing on stage. And I went and I watched it and he, I didn't know nothing about James Brown. He came out and within like 10 seconds, he was killing it so bad. It was like the entire place just got to their feet and they were just dancing and boogieing around and he was doing his thing and the whole place was just, completely in the moment. There was a show, it was a live concert by a band called Queen. Freddie Mercury is called Live Aid. 70,000 people in the audience, 70,000. And it was multicast, it was simulcast live across the world. There's millions of people watching at the same time. And Freddie Mercury and the band Queen, they came out, he sat, immediately he sat down at his keyboard, his piano, he played the first note on his piano. And from the first note he played, that entire 70,000 person stadium just started singing the words from the first word. It didn't have to warm up, didn't have to get into it. From the first word, all of those voices were singing at the same time. It was a spectacle and a show. Millions of people online watching Freddie Mercury and Queen just kill it. James Brown just kill it. Prince just kill it on the biggest stage in the biggest spotlight at the top of their talent. No one could say a word because they were at the top of their game and those moments lasted a second and now they're gone. People experience those moments and those shows you could sing in front of 70,000 people and have them all up on their feet singing your song. You could dance and sing in front of millions of people and have every single one of them bought into you saying, how great is this person up there doing that? Millions of people and at the end of the day, that was just a moment in time. People are gonna forget about Freddie Mercury and about James Brown 
and about Prince's Super Bowl halftime show. Those were moments in time, little drinks of water that maybe quenched a thirst for a minute or two. But the world has moved on and people have moved on. But let me tell you about Jesus. When I think of eternity with Jesus, I think of, there's this book by C.S. Lewis and it's, it talks about eternity. He like goes into this, the heavenly realm and it's like he's in this giant, beautiful, amazing world and it just goes on and on. He's walking and as he's walking, he's walking towards these mountains and he can see beyond those mountains are higher mountains and behind those mountains are higher mountains still and the deeper that he goes, the wider and the greater and the bigger he sees that heaven really is. So much so that he will never, ever finish exploring that place. He will never run out of things to see or adventures to have. And he's gonna be so lost in God and in Jesus and in that great light and that perfect love that you're gonna look at him and never run out of depth to stare at, never run out of praise, never run out of, never run out of it. Let's go, baby. <laughs> but it's true. It's true, man. I get, I get excited. Sometimes I'm in bed. I'm like trying to fall asleep and I'm thinking about that, man. And I'm like, that's why Paul says it's, he would actually prefer to be with the Lord, but he wants to stick around so that he can help the people know the Lord. Right? But he's looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to that day. Do you have that kind of faith today? because that's what the faith of the saints is, right? We believe that through Christ, we're gonna experience that kind of eternal life, that moment that ain't never gonna stop. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never hunger again. Jesus says, he's got the living water. Whoever drinks this will never thirst again. And all throughout the generations of the church, man, when they get together and they come together, they do this thing called communion and they take of the bread and they take of the drink that both symbolizes Jesus, right? The bread symbolizes his body, the blood, the, the, the drink symbolizes his blood. He says, whoever takes of this, whoever drinks of me, whoever eats of me will live forever. But if you ate the best meal, physical meal today, and you drank the best physical drink today, tomorrow you need to eat again. But with Jesus, it never runs dry, it never runs out. It's always new, it's always amazing, it's always refreshing, it's always, just always, just always. <laughs>